Hello everyone and good afternoon. My name is Craig. And I'm Chloe. Thank you for joining us today here at Crawley College, where we are pleased to welcome one of Crawley's very own. This man is a writer, producer and director. He is also the creator of a feature-length movie such as RH11, Little District and The Forbidden Note. He has received nominations and awards from various film festivals and has a career spanning over 12 years, whilst only being 30 years old or 30 years young. <laughs> we are privileged to have with us today, Mr. Callum Andrew Johnston. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Callum, thank you for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. No, my pleasure. My pleasure to be here. And it's always good, you know, a good opportunity to pass the information on to future filmmakers and especially from Crawley as I'm a, you know, very proud Crawley resident, born and raised. So it's good to be here. Yeah. Brilliant. So could you please tell us, how did you get interested in making movies? Um, it's a bit, a bit of a while back, but I, I got in, even though I got in pretty early, I would say it was quite late. A lot of people knew that they wanted to do kind of movies a bit earlier. I started off on the acting side so I was doing a lot of theater studies at that time and I didn't realize that I wanted to make movies until I started doing uh, media studies in sick form so pretty much where some of the people are at now who'll be watching this video and um, I was writing a, a, a play at the time so I was penning and I was creating in a, in a writing perspective but I didn't realize that I would transfer that play over onto screen so when I learned script writing I was like ah oh, that fits perfectly for me and that's something that I would like to to do but I think if I go back further than that it's actually was always kind of film was always you know myself I guess toying with the idea because I liked films I watched you know a ton of movies when I was a kid but I didn't realize I wanted to be a filmmaker I guess until that day when I realized oh script writing is pretty cool so yeah it was at that time really for me. Who are your inspirations whether it be in film or in real life? Um, in terms of movie when I got you know when I found myself um, penning my first script I was kind of going to Shane Meadows a lot I think Shane Meadows and at that time probably Guy Ritchie as I was a massive fan of Lotstock and Snatch um, but Shane Meadows, Shane Meadows type of films like Dead Man's Shoes were quite a lot of, you know, earlier on inspirations. Mm. And I really loved Shane Meadows, like establishing shots and just kind of really close up, you know, macro establishing shots of like houses or landscapes and stuff where he would really just focus in on certain subjects and then come out to a wider picture. So I guess earlier on when I got into filmmaking, that Shane Meadows style was pretty evident. So cross between quite gritty, but also touching on social subjects, which Shane Meadows does absolutely fantastically. Brilliant, brilliant. We note that you attended the New York Film Academy. That must have been a great experience for you. How did that come about? Um, again, that was by chance. So I wasn't set on going to university. I didn't think that I'd already made a feature film before I'd left college. So I thought, ah, oh, I kind of want to just pursue this now. But um, at that time, I was being advised that maybe you should kind of fine tune and get better and go on to further education. So I submitted RH11, the first feature film that I'd done when I was during my college days. And uh, they got back and offered me a full scholarship. So I was from very humble beginnings, very poor background. So to be offered like a $25,000 scholarship to go through New York Film Academy, you know, you can imagine I was flipping and jumping, thinking, oh, wow, I'm going to go out to New York. You see New York in all the movies when you're a kid. So I was just buzzing about going out to New York. But I probably completed about six months of the course and it was very hands on. I loved it. The course was brilliant. And if anyone ever has the opportunity to go out to study at the New York Film Academy, even though I didn't complete my course there, I would still endorse it as a great place to learn because it fitted very much in line with my kinetic way of learning, just learn by doing. Um, but, uh, yeah, it didn't work out financially. It wasn't viable for me to be there at that time. And I came back and hit a little bit of a lull when I came back after six months thinking maybe that was the opportunity for me that's kind of got away. And then there was a point uh, probably about six months after being back from New York that I thought, no, an opportunity came like that because I worked hard and I got my first feature film made. So don't be so down in the dumps about an opportunity that's got away. Just create another opportunity. And that's when I set about creating another feature film from there onwards. Brilliant. What did you take away from your time at the New York Film Academy? 
Again, probably uh, the short time that I was there, I probably would take away the just get out and make a movie attitude that they had. They very much instill that, um, you know, into their filmmakers. Don't be put off the, with this thing that you need to be so, you know, fought out about how you're going to make a movie to the point you don't do it. You know, the, the worst thing you can ever, ever do when it's getting to that point if you want to make a film is sit on it for so long that in your own mind it becomes a bit stale. Uh, I'm not really, a, um, you know, if I've got something on my slate, I try not to make my slate so crammed with with work that I become flooded with, oh, I'm never going to make any of these because there's too much to do. I'd rather just have one in mind and really focus and work hard towards bringing that to fruition. Um, so the learn by doing, I think, is probably mm. the biggest thing I took from that course. Fantastic advice. Thank you for that. How beneficial do you feel is to attend a film academy or an institution to get you started in filmmaking? I'm a, even though I didn't complete it, I'm still, like I said, I'm still massively an endorser of learning and further education. I think the vital skills, um, whether it's interpersonal skills or whether it's technical skills that you pick up on courses, even coming to Crawley College to, to learn film, are very vital. Um, and I think they will transfer quite nicely when you do step on a set. You, at least you know the technicality and the know-how of cameras or set practicalities and stuff. So I do think it's quite important to go to some sort of education to, to you know, be mentored or, or to train for film. Um, but at the same time, I think there's no really right way about going about making a movie. Someone will create a movie and they will think that's the correct way but there's a thousand different stories from a script. There's a thousand different ways of making a movie. So I think it's very important for young people when they're thinking about films and how to put them together is just because a chair was made in a certain way by an inventor doesn't mean that's the correct way to build a chair. And it's the same kind of application for film. Just because someone makes movies in that way doesn't fit, doesn't mean it aligns to how Craig should make a movie, for example, or myself should make a movie we, we make movies in how we perceive and i think go and get the training but explore you as an artist because that's what you're doing you're, you're you're having a perception on the world and you're sharing it through the medium of film it's important that you just go out and explore that you officially began your career in film when you wrote RH11 at the age of 16 that you went on to direct as a future length film at 17 years old releasing it at 18. So please tell us what obstacles you faced on your journey from writing the script to finishing it up on the last day of shooting. The, the first film that you'll ever make will be one of your hardest. And I decided to jump in with a feature film um, rather than start out with a short. Mm. I didn't know I was making a feature film at the time and I didn't know I was being a director and I didn't know really I was being a filmmaker. I just had this urge to tell a story. I was very passionate about the subject that we were trying to tell in that film, and that was knife crime. Um, you know, seeing a lot of young people lose their lives to, to knife crime at that time, I felt like I'd like to explore that story as a, as a, a storyteller. And I wrote a script. Then I thought, oh, we have to make it now into, a, into something film form. Like I said, at first it was a theater play. Then I was learning script writing, transferred it over to script. But I didn't know how to obviously make a movie. We'd only just learned kind of small bits of technicality on the course that we was on. So I had to network and, and, you know, and find other filmmakers and find other people. And I think it was the team at the time and the people that came on that film that made that film what it is today. It wasn't per se me, you know, as much as I had a massive, you know, input in the making of the movie. There was other creatives that came on and I think that collaboration of different people at that time I think really kind of made me understand that that's the key to making a movie it's the team it's not a one man effort or a one woman effort it's, it, it's you know one person would find it very difficult to do anything and everything in film you know so to actually be able to find the right team and the core people that are going to bring that vision to life is the most important thing um so for me challenging thing was um Having that self-belief that I could finish it, we were six months into filming and two actors pulled out and because they were very young, they were getting a bit of bullying and a bit of stick for being, being in the film. And a lot of people in their um, school were kind of bullying and teasing them. And they pulled out of the movie, but we had shot 
you know, six months in at this time. And you probably think, wow, you're filming over six months. And that's being because we were in college Monday to Friday, we were filming only weekends. Um, so it took us over about six months. Then we had to reshoot all their scenes, which took another six months. And there was a point then when they quit and I realized I had to go back and film things that I was already happy with and go back into them locations and just redo them put me off a bit because I felt what I had in them locations was great and organic and worked. And it's like, how do I replicate it without it feeling a bit boring and stale for me? Um, so I nearly quit. I won't lie quite early on. I thought this is too hard and this is what, you know, maybe I need to take a step back, just finish college and and stop doing what I'm doing because I'm clearly not doing it correctly. Um, and it's probably the greatest thing I ever done was just knuckle down, get the film made, persevere, reshoot and I think that's the the biggest challenge I had to face and I always look back on that tenacity that I had at the time and I think anyone that wants to get into film you have to be tenacious you can't go into this game thinking that you can just lull through it because it's problem solving problem solving problem solving and if you don't have the tenacity to deal with it it will eat you and consume you and you will be spat out by it. So it's like, just be tenacious and believe in what you're doing. Thank you. How long did it take you to shoot RH11? Uh, 12 months in total of filming. Uh, we were filming over weekends, as I said. Yeah. Um, and then obviously there was a reshoot. So yeah, it was 12 months. So you're watching through that film. It's like all the seasons are there. <laughs> but we, we did rewrites to try and do all the flashbacks over winter time. So we just held off on them. There was like flashback scenes that could have been at any time of the year. So as we knew we were getting further over the year, we just held them flashbacks like until the last thing we needed to film. And they happened to be over all the snow where it was snowing at the time. We had snow over our winters then. And uh, yeah, we filmed them over winter period. Fantastic. Uh, the making of RH11 and its sequel, Little District, led you on to go on and create The Forbidden Note. Like your other movies, they have some real hard-hitting, thought-provoking subjects and that regularly get overlooked by society. Are there any issues in society at the moment that you think is drawn your attention and you might want to shine some light on a certain issue going forward? At the moment, um, obviously mental health is a is a big, you know, social um and, and terrible thing that's plighting a lot of people, especially from from young young males, are susceptible to mental health. Um, I had my dealings with mental health pretty early on in my career. I think when I was getting into the third feature film, things didn't go correct on it. I wanted to step up my my game at that point and realise that after Little District, I needed to take my career a little bit more seriously, get a little bit more kind of information and knowledge about being on set and set commands and what cameras are right, what lenses are right, you know, how to break down color schemes and stuff like that. So I, I put a lot of effort into that film at that time and things didn't go to, the, you know, to the way that I thought they would go. And um, I had to take a break from filming The Forbidden Note because at that point I was not in the right mind space mentally. Um, so I look back at that point in my life and I think, I know how easy it is when things get hard that you you want to push the escape button. So that's something that I'm quite passionate about talking about and, and exploring in my films now moving forward. Um, I, I think for me, we need stories from people that are experiencing these things. So it would be very, after the forbidden note, when I was exploring a story that wasn't per se something that had happened to me, I realized that I should stay in my lane a little bit. So I think that was one thing that I reflected back on as a filmmaker. As much as I was impacted by something that happened um, to a woman locally here in Crawley when it came to like dishonor killing, I realized that um, that story needed an extra voice from someone that had actually really experienced that. And I was pretty much telling that story from the outside looking in. And I don't think you can be as true to the story when you're outside looking in. So I think I came away from that film realizing, yes, I was trying to do a noble thing, tackle a sensitive subject, bring bring light to obviously a horrible subject like dishonor killing and what happens to, to many women up and down the country and around the world. But at the same time, I should have stayed in my lane a little bit and maybe brought on another writer who actually had experienced that. Um, um, so for me, it's like uh, my advice for filmmakers moving forward is, you know, really mm. think about the stories that you're telling and some of the things that you've been through in your own lives 
and tell them stories. So if we are talking about, you know, at the moment with George Floyd and the tragedy that happened with him and Black Lives Matter being a thing, I think we need more voices and we need more um, storytellers from, from that world. You know, we need more black people writing films and we need more black directors. Um, so it'd be very difficult for me now to really kind of force that in if I'm not, you know, from that ilk, so to mm. speak. So yeah, in a long roundabout way, that's my, my thoughts reflecting back on that time on the forbidden note. Thank you. Nice. The world has changed so much since when you first began your career. So how have the challenges changed from when you started making RH11 to any difficulties you face now? I think it's changed for the best. Um, as much as the world's outside of films become mm. mad, um, in terms of the film world, I mean, I'm jealous of the what, what young filmmakers have at their disposal in Arsenal now. So it's like, I look at the technology that's around and I'm like, ah, 12 years ago, if you'd given me that 4K mirrorless camera to shoot RH11, mm. I would have been in heaven as a filmmaker, yeah. you know? So I think you have to be careful. There's a fine line between allowing that change in technology to kind of, you know, throw you a bit where you think, oh, what camera, oh, there's too much kind of going on. Or oh, I need the latest 8K, 12K, or it needs to do this. It needs to be able to shoot 120 and 4K. It's like, don't let the tech daunt, you know, mm. daunt you to a point that you don't make something. Um, so I think just pick up any, any kind of mirrorless camera that can at least shoot, you know, even 1080p and just get creative with it. Um, so the, the cheaper the technology is now, it's so accessible for young people to get into film. And that's why I decided to launch the Crawley Film Initiative over the last years, because I realized that now that there's, there's so many budding filmmakers who could just jump in tomorrow and borrow a camera even from probably the college um, and start exploring. But it's like they're, they're kind of maybe, maybe the biggest problem that young people are going to face now is, is competition. And I think they're probably going to find there's a lot of filmmakers out there just turning out content and that might daunt them a little bit and throw them off. But at the same time, I think don't let competition throw you off because it's about collaboration. And if someone gets a bit further than you and you think I could have got, you know, I'm not at that level yet. It's okay. Just keep chipping away and you will get there. If you're dedicated, you want it and you're tenacious, you will get to a level that you're, you're going to be happy with. Brilliant. What do you think would be the biggest surprise to someone new to the industry? The biggest surprise? Um, I think biggest surprise probably for the industry, and it always has been, and it was the biggest surprise for me, um, is the distribution process. Um, I think the, the figures on distribution is on, on all 100% of movies that are made in the world, 5% of them get looked at for distribution and then only 5% of that number gets bought and then only 5% of the ones bought make money. That's under your Hollywood level. So as an indie filmmaker, when you make a movie and you think, ah, I've made a film, let's go and sell it. And then you realize no one wants to buy it or you can't sell it. Um, I think that will, that will throw a lot of people because that distribution model is much as films changed and technologies change and you've got the ability now to self distribute through Amazon and other places like streaming places. It's difficult to make money on these streaming sites. And I think it devalues the industry a little bit, you know, Amazon prime at the moment over COVID changed seven P per hour of a film streamed to one P. So you get a penny for every 60 minutes that someone looks at your film. You're not going to make any money. So the streaming side, as much as it's great to get your first earlier work out on these streaming sites and try and build an audience that like your film, it's still a business. And I think there's that, there's that fine line when you realize that you're doing a hobby and then you're on a career path because you've gone to uni and you've studied film. And now it's like, I've just spent all this time, three, four years studying film. Mm -hmm. It's a career. And then people don't want to pay you or your film's not making money. You're now at a point thinking, maybe I should do something else. And we're devaluing the industry every single time we sell our film or give our film away for nothing. We devalue the industry when we work for nothing. We have to accept that we're trained and we're doing something in this career path because it's a skill. It's no different to any other skill on the planet that you're going to learn through college or university. 
you're thinking about um, the meet the form of media now, how important filmmakers are to the world. You, you like some of the most important people in the world without a news story. You know, you ain't covering COVID. You ain't covering George Floyd. No, there's no camera. There's no George Floyd. There's no Black Lives Matter. So it's, it's very important for filmmakers to understand their value. And again, that's why we launched Crawley Film Initiative. We, we want to work hand in hand with students that are at college to teach them that value, to instill the confidence in that you can put an invoice in for your work and be paid for it. Um, so there, there's some things that might throw people. Distribution, how much money am I should be charging for working on a video? These are the things that are going to throw people. Can I make a living doing this or is this a hobby? Um, I don't think you should go into film with this mentality that you're going to train in film as a hobby. If you're training and you're spending all this time training, look at it as a career and you're going to pay your rent or pay your mortgage or I don't know, years down the line, feed your children doing the medium. So it's very important to understand that. How do you overcome any creative blocks? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, you're going to have them. Mm. The hardest thing you'll ever do is write a script because you'll have nights where you're just like, or days, I'm a night writer. Some people might find it better in the mm. day, but you'll have nights where you're just, you know, 10 pages and you're like, yeah, smash that. Then you'll have other nights where you're just like, why can't I get anything out? Or why am I deleting something? It's literally a process that will absolutely soul destroy you. But at the same time, once it's done, give you this unbelievable, like self belief that you have done it. You've got to the end of mapping out a story that's from your mind and it's on paper now and it can translate for other people to read and, and, Oh, I can see what you're trying to do here. Then that next stage is obviously the production. That part is just problem solving. Mm. The writing and the mapping out is the hard part. Um, so I think getting over the creative blocks, I think just allow it, Al allow them. Like every time you get a creative block, allow it. Like I used to get really upset about it. Like, oh, I can't get it out of my head. Or what's going on? Why am I? It's cool. Put the kettle on, <laughs> put your feet up. Maybe go and watch some movies. Maybe go and watch a series. Relax. Take the brain off what you're doing mm. and it will come. Uh, and I think most of the things that I actually take from my creative blocks and start mapping out the, the stories that I'm working on is just by going off and living. It's like, we're, 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 this is our film, our eyes and our brain. You know, that's our camera at all times. That's rolling all the time. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm out walking and I see a conversation or I see something happen. I'm like, Prrr. as a film director, you have to be analytical on every little thing that you're doing. I mean, and people should be telling me off to like stopping and staring and saying, why are you, why are you listening into my conversation? It's like, there's something that you're saying could be applied and might be put into a story that helps someone else find relation to. And that's the thing that's going to change the world. Oh, I relate to that. I relate to that story. So as a filmmaker, you have to be turning your camera on all the time, all the time. Some great advice. Thank you. What would you consider as your greatest achievement till date? In film? <laughs> yes, we're talking Sorry, about film. Sorry, in film, yeah. <laughs> um, I would say recently the Crawley Film Initiative. Yeah. As much as I've been to Cannes and sold a film and made some money um, and met famous people and worked with famous people, um, that doesn't really phase me. It's like when I got into film, it's like one day I always pictured that that would happen. You know, if I'm on set and there's an actor who's been in lots of things I've seen, they're, they're a human being that's a creative and I'm a creative and we're syncing up and we're synergizing so that we can make something. So I, that doesn't really phase me or I don't come away from their moments and think, oh, I've, I've made it. I've worked with someone awesome. I think for me, it's the giving back. Um, I always felt that, it, you know, at some point in my career, there will be a give back. I'm not one of these people that climbs a ladder and pulls it up. You know, I want to put my hand down and grab people up with it. So Crawley Film Initiative, I think, is probably the biggest achievement because we launched it during COVID. It was a difficult time to launch it. And um, 
I think the the you know the ethos and the values that it has align with pretty much anything and everything that a filmmaker is 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 wanting to achieve in their career. And I think it aligns perfectly and and holds hands and complements the the journey that most young filmmakers will even face going to college. So it's a nice hand in hand. You can go to college, learn the technicalities, go and make short films, find out who you are in that in that sector. But you can also come to the film initiative and learn something else. Mm-hmm. So I think that's just going to be so exciting for the town and for the local people here. And you know, I, I want to find that that next, you know, Callum Andrew Johnston who was 16 thinking, I don't know what to do. How do I make a film and, and be there for them? Because I, but going back to when I was 16, 17, there wasn't something like that in place that people can go and do these films. Uh, that's probably going to be, uh, to date, my biggest achievement and probably one of my favourite achievements to get that launched. What do you think are the most important qualities for a director to have? Um, it would be very... It would be very wrong of me to say they need to have certain qualities or they must have certain qualities. I think we're all unique in our own way. Um, I think every director, as we know, we've had some mad ones famously in time. If you think about Quentin Tarantino, he's absolutely, you know, odd as anything, but amazing at what he does. So I think there's, you know, people probably see directors like Quentin Tarantino and think, wow, I need to be flamboyant and I need to be, you know, an extrovert and I need to be wacky and crazy because that's what a director is. They're wacky and crazy. And it's like some of the best directors I've ever, you know, rubbed shoulders with have been really reserved and cool and humble and they can just problem solve just really quietly. Um, um, I'd probably say uh, Lawrence Till, who I worked with on Shameless, was one of the most um, just genuine, humble, really softly spoken, gentle souls ever. And the way he directs people, I'm just like, wow. Like, you know, there's no shouting, there's no qualms. It's just we're making a TV series. Yeah, it's cool. Things will happen. <laughs> so he was very, like, different. Um, so I don't think there's any qualities that people should have per se, but I do think people need to find out who they are as a filmmaker. So it's very important for every single person that wants to be a director to just accept that they have to be unique and themselves and explore who they are through film. And then naturally you'll find the stories that you want to tell. You'll find who you, you know, how, how you tell them through your own perception. And I think being you and being unique, that's the quality. It's not, You've got to take inspiration, no doubt, of course, but I mean, find your own self within this this art form that we love so much. Um, so that's probably the only thing I could say to that rather than you need to be, I don't know, cool or great or amazing. <laughs> so you were saying about, you've mentioned problem solving a few times. There's been a few times you were on set yourself and there was yeah. times where you've seen other directors on set. Would you think problem solving would be a great quality to have? Yeah, if you're talking about qualities, I think problem solving is definitely a quality that um, human beings should have in all aspects of of their careers. Um, I think throwing yourself in social uh, situations or raising your hand and putting yourself to the forefront on certain situations is always going to be a life experience that can be be applied to anything. Um, So I think by making your short films and by going out and exploring, you will come away from that process and think, I didn't problem solve correctly. Oh, I spanned too many plates. Oh, I dropped the ball here. And and that's great. We learn by our mistakes. And I think we can't be perfect every time. And I don't think we can be perfect all the time. So I think it's important that people just explore, do, create mistakes, learn from them, reapply it to the next, to the next, to the next. And that's called mastering your craft you don't master a craft without falling down many times. Can you tell us about any up and coming projects you have currently underway or plan to start production of? Yeah. So we're, we're coming round full circle on the next project, um, that I've got in production at the moment. So, um, my career started off with RH 11 and that's what I'm most known for in the town. That's what launched me as a filmmaker. And when we launched the Prawley Film Initiative, the first 
uh, thing that we were very passionate about was creating. Um, we want to create content that gives young people a chance to actually work with professionals side by side where they're actually working on fully, you know, running sets with professionals who have got a career in the industry. And just by doing that, they will pick up skills. The skills will be transferred and the mentoring won't be, oh, do it like this, or you need to do it like this. It will just be learned by doing. Mm. Um, I'm a big believer on that ethos and that's what we're doing with the CFI. Um, so the next project we're doing is actually going full circle and it's going back to RH11 just because it's the relaunch of um, the CFI, I guess, in terms of what people are more familiar with me as a filmmaker around here. Um, so we're doing a four-part mini-series. It's a 45-minute episodic um, and we've we've got a professional actor who at the moment is in Hollyoaks, going to be um, one of the lead roles in the, in the series. Um, and that, that project's going to be tackling county lines, uh, so antisocial behaviour, county line drug dealing. Um, and we're working with Sussex Police in partnership with Sussex Police to tackle certain subjects. So it aligns quite nicely with the themes that we try to, you know, put into our films. Um, so that's the next project that we're shooting in about February, March time. So it's just around the corner. Um, and I've got a documentary at the moment that's in post-production, which comes out hopefully at the start of next year and that should be on a cinema run so uh, that's called the balance and i helped produce that film um, and also was one of the cinematographers on that film i wasn't a director the director was um a gentleman i've collaborated with on quite a few projects now called abra hussein who's you know, wonderful and fantastic at what he does um so that film's coming out soon and hopefully we do a, another cinema tour like we did with the, the previous documentaries um so that's going to be, it's going to be great to go back to directing because I've not directed something since the forbidden note. So, um, the introduction should have said writer, producer, and sometimes a director, I think <laughs> it's been a while, but it's nice to just, um, you know, brush off the cobwebs, get back on the director's chair. Although I have directed like music videos and stuff, mm. but not a longer narrative piece. Nice. <laughs> What's been your favorite moment in your career so far? Um, I guess probably one of the most, probably one of, was hard. It was a very hard job to do. I was a producer on a film called One Night in Aksa, which is a documentary um, about the hardship the Palestinians face uh, from the border crossings into East Jerusalem, into the old city. Um, and it was centered around the most powerful night of Ramadan, which is called the Night of Power. And it's normally on the 27th night, uh, in Ramadan and we went out there and we, we worked with, you know, a crew from out there and to go abroad and internationally make a movie, um, was something that was always a, a dream of mine. I knew it would be hard, hard work, but I always felt that if you can take yourself from, from Crawley, um, and actually be, you know, honored enough to go and produce another film in another country. And then we did release that film and it went out to cinema as well was probably one of them moments was, you know, where that premiered at Leicester Square and went on a cinema run in about five or six different countries was probably one of the proudest moments in terms of, of an accolade of me as a filmmaker. Um, but again, the CFI kind of is challenging that because mm. I'm just mad on this whole give back to the next. Um, and I think that as well is, you know, a big achievement. Brilliant. It must have been great. Uh, you've touched on it a few times and we want you to go into a bit more detail about the Crawley Film Initiative. It sounds like some very exciting stuff for the young filmmakers out there in the local, the local area. Uh, could you tell us about more? Where can the students go? Where can any young filmmakers watching this video, where can they go to find out more information about the Crawley Film Initiative? Yep. So the, the Crawley Film Initiative has its own website so you can just google crawley film initiative or go to www.crawleyfilm.org um, there's information about some of the projects that we have on the go there's also some of the past projects there's a bit of a detail about what what the whole thing is what it's what it's um, been set up for um, and then there's an application form on the contact page and it's just a simple process of making yourself known to us, who you are, what you're doing. Just answer a few questions. Give us a little bit of information about who you are. At that point, we normally schedule like a quick Zoom call or something 
just this, just again, pick your brain, see who you are. Um, and then if you're interested, we're, we're constantly working on different projects and it's an opportunity if people want to come to us for work experience, if people want to come uh, on some of our training courses, if people want to work on some of our client projects. And if we think people are at different levels where they, um, we see them as, you know, good enough to be paid for what they do, they can come on the client projects and actually be paid as well for their time. Um, so it just depends on the process they're at. Again, we're putting the RH11 series through the, through the Crawley Film Initiative, which gives a lot of opportunities for young people to come on to that project as a filmmaker, as a, as a production designer. If you're, make, if you're interested in makeup, costume, you can get involved in them departments and work with a professional, and that professional can just give you some center, center point um, with your career to date. So there's, yeah, there's information online. Maybe at the end we'll show the launch trailer um and that gives a little bit of information about what it is that we are even get the links in the description of the video for anyone watching they can just check the description and get the links to the yeah the website yeah directly. we're going to be based at um crawley museum so we're literally a stone throw from the college uh we've got a training so one of our rooms is a workshop training space um that's a, anyone that's a member of the Crawley Film Initiative can come and use that space and hire that space for free if they just want to come there and write or they they want to cast a film. Maybe you you want to use the space as a, as a place that you can cast your movie or rehearse or do tabletop reads. Um, so that space can be used for our filmmakers. Plus, we're probably going to do some like every fortnight, we'll probably set up some film kind of club where people can go and interact with other people in the town who are interested in film. Um, that that membership's free for 16 to 25s and then over 25s. So Craig, so you have to pay oh. a fortune. After. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, anyone can come along, be a member uh, and um, use uh, utilize the space over at the museum. Nice. Lovely. Uh, I've got a couple more questions for you, if that's okay. No worries. Uh, just one second. Would you recommend in trying to attain a full-time position with a company? Or do you think it's more beneficial to be a freelance director filmmaker? I think, again, it's difficult for me to sit here and tell someone that they should focus on one path or the, or the next because um, everyone's different. Some people might love the freelancing gig. They might actually be in a, a better position to actually be a freelancer. Um, they might like that going around and never know what you're working on. I think you get that a bit with production companies you work for, depending on their clientele, but some freelancers struggle, you know, they they don't get enough work or they get too much or they then don't get, they get periods, dry periods. So it depends on the person really. And it depends on what you get involved in. I think you have to keep both options open. You know, if you're dedicated to having a career in film and a, and a production company comes up and it aligns with you and you think you're going to learn loads from it and you think the work that they do is great. And that's about, that's, that's you jump in. I think there's a fine line between filmmaking and videography so you know being a cinematographer and a videographer are two different things some people might do a lot of videography work and start getting numb to filmmaking you know i'm not in, i'm not enjoying film anymore but you're not doing film you you're doing something a little bit different you're using a camera but you're using it in a very different way so i think if you are doing that and you are feeling a little bit stale and numb i think always keep a passion project on the side if you you want to produce a short film or you want to direct a short film or a comedy series or something Keep penning it, keep writing it, and do it, you know, hand in hand. Probably the only advice that I could give. Brilliant, thank you. And finally, what do you think would be the best advice to give any aspiring filmmakers out there? The best advice? <laughs> I keep going back to this whole, <laughs> it's not for me to give some <laughs> solid advice. Um, it's just do it. you gotta, you got to be brave. If you think that, oh, I'm not good enough, or I'm not, I'm not sure if this is right. I think people might ridicule it. I don't think people are going to get the idea. It's for you. you. Make a film for you. Make a film that you'll be proud to have sat, you know, in your library. That is your slate at the end of the day. You're the filmmaker. Um, don't get too caught up if someone's going to like it. Or I need to please people. I need to put that in there, that in there, that in there. I mean, I've done that. The, my, my advice would be don't do that because I've done it and it doesn't, doesn't work. There's nothing worse with, you know, for you as a filmmaker for your film to fall between two stools. You know, the saying of it's, it's not quite that and it's not quite that and you get lost in the middle 
so it doesn't have an audience. You'd rather go and sit promptly on one, so, you know, one stall, have solid structure, foundations, and at least every single person that loves sitting on that stall as well is going to love it. Whereas if you fall between it, you're missing your audience. So just be brave. Um, don't try and cram so much in to be too clever. Sometimes simple, less is more. Find your story. For me, it's like I like themes. And I like exploring themes. So I, I always picture my films when I'm writing. It's like I have to have a running thread, you know, that running plot boom, just from there to there has to be there. And then everything else, if there's themes being, you know, woven into that plot, then it's cool. But at least every time you come away from a theme, you go back onto that plot, you're at the thread. As long as the thread's there, you shouldn't mm. disengage with an audience. Fantastic. There's been some great answers from you. It's been very invaluable insight we've had. So it's, thank you so much. My for, pleasure. For joining us thank today. You. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been Craig. And I'm Big Chloe. This has been an interview with Cal and Andrew Johnston. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the occasion. We certainly have. So no, no, I thoroughly you so much. enjoyed it. It's always good to, like I said, give back to the next crop of filmmakers, especially locally. So it's yeah. actually, hopefully it's, you know, there's some insight and some, some value to some of the words I've said. And all it is is about inspiring and just bringing confidence to the next group of people. Yeah. Thank you so much. Our thanks would also like to be extended to our lecturers, Clive and Adam, for setting this up for us. Thank you for watching. This has been an audience with Callum Andrew Johnson. Mm -hmm.